Well, this is a great segue to the next topic, which is super interesting and comes up a lot. I want to demystify this for people. As we're talking about low carbohydrate diets, let's dig into physiologic insulin resistance. So you and I talked a lot before I did the podcast with the folks from Mastering Diabetes who are two great guys who are treating type 1 diabetes with a fruitarian diet. And one of the things that I... Um, that podcast may or may not be out when this one comes out. Whenever I do a podcast with you, it always burns a hole in my hard drive because I think this is great information. <laughs> I got to get it out to people. But one of the things that is sometimes leveled against ketogenic diets, quote, mm-hmm. by people who are favoring high carb is that ketogenic diets cause insulin resistance. And I think this is very misleading and overly generalized. So let's dig into this and help people understand the difference between pathological systemic insulin resistance and what we might call glucose sparing at the level of the muscle, which is a normal physiologic phenomenon during a low carbohydrate diet. Yeah. So I think where this all starts um, is with a misconception about what insulin does um, and then conflating two very different states, physiological states. And so the like we talked about the the main role of or one of the main roles of insulin in my mind is anti-catabolism which means that it stops you breaking down tissue everybody thinks that the role of insulin is to shove glucose into cells and i think that that is the case because um that we discovered insulin and we focused on insulin because of type 1 diabetes and the treatment of type 1 diabetes in type 1 diabetes you have to take exogenous um insulin you have to inject it um, because you don't, you're not making any. And in that scenario, you're injecting insulin peripherally at a dose that will push glucose into cells. Um, one of the one of the ways that it controls blood sugar though is by acting on the tissues, muscle tissue, um, fat tissue, to not break down and deliver gluconeogenic gluconeogenic substrate to the liver. So the liver is making a lot of this glucose and then you are stopping the supply of substrate because it, you know, unabated, no insulin, your muscle starts to break down, your fat starts to break down. Um, the amino acids, fatty acids, glycerol are just delivered to the liver and the liver's like, crap, I better make glucose out of this because that's all I can do. And again, there's no insulin, so there's no breaks on the liver doing that. So the liver just pumps out all this extra glucose. And all of this is kind of conflated because if you inject insulin and glucose goes down, you're assuming, oh yeah, that's because the glucose has been shoved into a cell. It's not just that. It's also that the liver is making less glucose. And in type two diabetes, uh, that is where most of the glucose is coming from. It's unabated gluconeogenesis in the liver. And that is happening because the fat tissue particularly, but also potentially the muscle tissue is insulin resistant. It is said, no more insulin for me. I have enough energy on board in my cell that I'm not using. Um, so you can't shove any more into me. And then you get to a point where they start to break break down. You have amino acid turnover in the muscle. You have fatty acid turnover in, in the adipose tissue. And those um, are then delivered to the liver, which again um, has this, it's partly supply driven. Like this stuff just shows up and it's like, well, what am I going to do with it? It's um, glucose is less toxic than having loads, you know, loads of glycerol and free fatty acids and all this stuff just like floating around. So I'm going to turn it into glucose. Um, and and this is why um, the states are so different in, in physiological ins- insulin resistance where uh, blood glucose is low because you're not getting in any in through the diet. And then you have tissues, particularly the muscle tissue, which uh, can adapt to using free fatty acids released either from the diet or released from the adipo- uh, released from the adipose tissue if you're if you're in a deficit. And then there are some tissues in the body that do have um, a, a requirement for glucose; they can't fat adapt, particularly certain cells in the brain and the red blood cells. So you need whatever glucose you have to be spared for those for those cells. So the muscle tissue says, do you know what? I can run on fat, so I'm just gonna turn off this insulin signal um, and you don't need to give me any glucose because I'm sparing the glucose for the rest of the body. And in that state, yes, you will also have elevated free fatty acids like you do in um, type two diabetes, but you have very low glucose. So there's a completely different state. This is the body um, and because of the role of insulin, this is the body deciding where which nutrient should go because nutrient partitioning is, is insulin's essentially its main job. And that is insulin acting correctly. In that state, you don't have enough glucose to run all the cells in your body. So the body selectively says, this can run on fat, this needs glucose, so it's going to be spared 
for, for those tissues. But what happens is then if you give somebody um, uh, a boatload of carbohydrate and they've been on, uh, on a ketogenic diet for a long period of time, those cells have still turned down the insulin signal, right? So you're going to get this massive spike in blood sugar and say, holy crap, this guy is, has insulin resistance. But if you had them eat some carbohydrates for three or four days, you know, this is probably somebody who in that interim um, improved their, uh, particularly if they were overweight or insulin resistant before, you know, they improved their body composition, uh, potentially maybe lost some weight. Um, you know, their metabolic health has almost certainly improved, but you just need to give them some carbohydrate for them to like turn that, turn that signal back on. So this is, it's complex physiology. We really need a whiteboard, yeah. a lecture. <laughs> but I, I love this conversation. So what Tommy is saying, I'll just try and summarize it or re, uh, regurgitate it for people in a different way, and hopefully it'll become uh, even more clear. During states of low carbohydrate consumption of a diet, the body does something which is natural called physiologic insulin resistance at the level of the muscle or glucose sparing is probably a better word. And so what's happening there, and there are studies which show that even one low carb meal at night can do this. And so pregnant women who are doing a glucose tolerance test or a glucola the next day should not be doing a low carb meal, or they can do a low carb meal if they want to, but if, you do, if a pregnant woman does a low carb meal the night before uh, a glucose tolerance test, they can look insulin resistant the next day because mm -hmm. that test is sort of flawed, right? And what's going on there is that when we increase the amount of fat in our diet and when we decrease the amount of carbohydrates, there are different signals from the adipose tissue because of declining levels of insulin, right? <clears throat> so what we know is that if we don't eat carbohydrates, if we eat a high, if we eat a high fat, low carb diet with a moderate amount of protein, insulin signal drops. And when the insulin signal at the, at the adipocytes drops, they change the fatty acids that they put out into the blood. Mm -hmm. And it shifts from, correct me if I'm wrong here, palmitoleic acid to palmitate. And then palmitate circulates to the muscle cells and kind of gives them the signal, hey, refuse glucose. We've got plenty of free fatty acids. Spare the glucose for the brain and the red blood cells. <clears throat> and this is physiologic insulin resistance quote, which should be glucose sparing. This is a very different state because in this glucose sparing state, as you said, insulin is low, glucose is low, yeah. right? And it's really only the muscle that is refusing glucose. It's not, you know, it, it, and, and, and it's really only the muscle that is becoming resistant to the actions of insulin or saying, hey, I'm not gonna listen to you insulin, I'm gonna do my free fatty acids, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to really listen to insulin as much because insulin levels are very low yeah. in terms of glucose partitioning. But in type two diabetes, it's a very different situation. And as you and I have talked about, insulin resistance, systemic, pathologic insulin resistance, we want to, I want to talk about what you think causes that, but I think one of the main things that causes it is mixed carbohydrate and fat overfeeding. So we get lots of calories, the adipocytes are stuffed full of lipids, and the adipocytes are saying, whoa, I am full to my brim, and the adipocytes become insulin resistant, they refuse the actions of insulin, and the adipocytes are initiating this cascade and they're doing the same thing, which is why it looks confusing. They're, they're shifting to palmitate, they're telling the muscles to stop refusing uh, glucose and the signals of insulin, but it's coming from the adipocytes because in many situations they are over full of calories in the form of fatty acids. And in that situation, insulin is high yeah, and glucose is high, right? Yeah. And so when I was trying to talk to the guys on this podcast from Mastering Diabetes, I said, we cannot define insulin resistance independent of levels of systemic insulin because glucose sparing is low insulin and systemic pathologic insulin resistance like type diabetes is very high insulin, which is why we check fasting insulin, why we check C-peptide. And that's a very good sort of indicator whether we're in a state of low carb, high fat, normal, or if we're, or we're in a state of hyperinsulinemia. So if we are insulin resistant or the body's not getting a whole lot of signals at the liver, at the adipocyte, in the muscle when insulin is low. It's still getting some, and you and I have talked about how insulin signaling is not entirely driven by absolute insulin levels, that things can change at that level. But if there are high levels of insulin in the body and things and tissues are not responding to insulin, that is physiologic insulin resistance. And that is the case in which glucose is high. Oh, that, that, is, that is pathologic yeah. insulin resistance, right. We need better terms, thank you. <clears throat> That is pathologic insulin resistance, and that is the case that you're describing where the adipocytes are releasing fat, 
and there's all these substrates coming to the liver and gluconeogenesis does appear to be at least somewhat supply driven. Mm -hmm. And the liver, as you said, is incorrectly gluconeogenosizing, <laughs> like jazzercise. <laughs> the liver has its headband on, <laughs> it's got a big fro, and it is gluconeogenosizing like crazy and making glucose from all this substrate. And that's what I love that you pointed that out that high levels of glucose in pathologic insulin resistance are predominantly related to just the liver gluconeogenesizing like crazy, like because of the signaling that's different. So these are very different states. Yeah. Did I, did I say all that right? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's right. The, um, <clears throat> the, the thing that really drives me crazy when people talk about insulin resistance is that they, they base this all on essentially, um, what we call the euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp, which is basically that this is like the gold standard of testing insulin sensitivity. And what, what that involves is hooking you up with multiple drips, um, putting uh, both glucose and insulin straight into your circulation and seeing how, you know, if, if I give this boatload of carbohydrate, how much insulin does it take to sh to to clear that glucose to like shove it to shove it into cells and like when when you do that then physiologic insulin resistance or glucose sparing and type 2 diabetes will look very similar but it's all based on this flawed concept that the job of insulin is to shove glucose into cells so you're using the wrong test to to really to really understand this or so you're not using it you're not re really using it in context and i think that's that's where the big problem comes from that the the main test that we use the gold standard is based on a flawed physiological understanding of what insulin does or a limited understanding yeah, yeah. and as you and i talked about there are multiple roles of insulin and this was your sort of paradigm that the first role of insulin was an autocrine effect in the pancreas yeah. sort of limiting glucose so let's just why don't you just give people sort of your perspective on the higher some sort of hierarchy what are the roles of insulin and where does pushing glucose into cells fall in that hierarchy yeah so so it, so it does do that once the dose once the level is high enough and so i think about insulin as it tours through the body like where does it if it's produced normally in the pancreas where does it go first and then what does it do and in that order so in you know, as soon as it's released in the pancreas, it acts to inhibit the release of, glu of glucagon, as long as the pancreas is insulin sensitive. And glucagon obviously being part of the signal telling you to break down tissue and activate glu gluconeogenesis in the liver. And so it first it does that, it suppresses glucagon secretion, um, and then it goes to the liver where it alters uh it turns gluconeogenesis on and off you know are you um you know needing to make more glucose or less and obviously if you're in a ketogenic state you will need more gluconeogenesis and there is some some evidence for that because you're not getting that carbohydrate in the diet and so insulin is low more gluconeogenesis and then it goes out into the circulation um and the first thing that it does is to suppress or be anti-catabolic in the muscle tissue um and the adipose tissue so when you um They've done nice studies where you basically uh, inject insulin into like one limb and then you look at the amount of a substrate coming in and coming out. So at the lower doses of insulin, um, you reduce uh, circulating fatty acids. So the first thing that it does is uh, be anti-catabolic in the in the adipose tissue or start to cause the uptake of of fatty acids from the circulation and then to actually then to start finally shoving glucose into cells you need you need to to increase the dose yet again so of all the things that insulin does requiring the highest circulating amount the final thing is is uh glucose uptake into cells.